Good morning. Um, some of you may already know this. I'm going to be scooting out of here right after the service. My mom is having major surgery tomorrow in Iowa, and Holly and um, her husband, whose name escapes me, Phil, are going to be taking me right to SFO so I can get there by midnight tonight and be at the at the hospital at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. So do be in prayer for her. She has um, some pretty serious cancer, and so we're hoping that this surgery is going to really help. Um, so today we're, gonna, we're not going to take up all three chapters of um, Daniel. Uh, it would be way too much. Um, but I do want to remind us a little bit about Daniel and sort of give a little background, and then I'll read the portion that we're going to listen to for this morning. Um, Daniel is a complicated book. Um, if you've read it all the way through, I don't know, has anybody here read it all the way through? Some of you, yeah. I, I don't really recommend it to be honest. <laughs> um, it's sort of like I have a relationship with Daniel, the same relationship I have with the book of Revelation, right? It's another one of those things that, you know, sort of like it's not for the faint of heart, and I don't actually recommend it. And you, it's not good for unaccompanied reading, for sure. Um, Daniel, the stories that we were taught in Sunday school, most of us are the ones about the Daniel in the lion's den, which we just heard with the kids this morning, and the, this one that we're about to hear about the fiery furnace and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's a, a, even a song. You know, some of us might know the song. Um, and, but there's a, and in the first chapter, there's an even earlier story, which is about this similar kind of story of, of resistance. Um, and that is that the king wants the people to feast and celebrate, and the way that he identifies that is for everybody to sit at and eat at the same food that he and his people are eating, and the Israelites say, well, no, we can't do that. You know, it's against the, our rules to eat these certain things. So there's resistance all the way through the book of Daniel. You do have to read around this really wackadoodle stuff that has to do with apocalyptic endings and um, terrorism and really frightening things that, that um, can give kids nightmares. So it's, if it isn't enough to sit in a lion's den or a fiery furnace, if that isn't enough, there's plenty more. Um, We've been taught to think about Daniel as a prophetic voice, but actually ancient scholars, rabbis, saw this as sort of wisdom, a kind of lens that we look through to help us make sense of the world and um, uh, help us make sense of a world that is more and more and more causing us to have a sort of cognitive dissonance. The Israelites were facing that too as they were in exile. The world around them didn't make sense. They didn't understand their environment. They, didn't, they, they did not like their environment. Um, in short, Daniel was meant to guide them through this um, T terrible time in their lives and to help them understand what they can do, what they could do, and what they must do in the face of, of injustice and God's um, call to them to remain the people of God even though they felt far away from home. So let's enter in with that background. Let's enter in. I'm actually going to start, I know you're going to have on the screen here starting with verse 16, but I'm actually going to read starting with verse 1. It's a long passage, so just hang with me. I'll, I'll pause, we'll breathe a little bit in the middle. But it's, I think it's important to have the beginning um, understanding of the scene. Now King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then he sent for the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and all the officials of the provinces to assemble, to come to the dedication of the statue that he had just set up. So the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, you're, I'm not going to repeat this every time, but this phrase occurs five or six times in this passage. Daniel is trying to make a point. Nebuchadnezzar has some power, and he likes his people around him. This is a story about Nebuchadnezzar's pride and his need to be worshipped. 
The herald proclaimed aloud, you commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the drum, etc., etc., it goes on and on and on. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Woe is right. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of all of those instruments, they gathered before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And accordingly, at this certain time, some Chaldeans came forth and denounced the Jews. They said to the king, O king, long may you live. O king, you have made a decree. O king, Daniel and his friends, the Jews, are not doing it. They pay you no heed, O king. They do not serve your gods and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, furious in rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. And so they brought them in before the king. And he said to them, Is it true that you're not going to serve my gods? That you're not going to worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of all those instruments, fall down before the statue that I've made and all will be well. But if you do not, I will throw you into the furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, it's important that tone, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, because everybody else says, O oh, my king, O oh, my king. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego start right off with resistance. O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense before you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from a furnace of blazing fire out of your hand, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods, and we will not worship the golden statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted and he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven more times than was customary. And he ordered the strongest guards in his army to bind them and throw them into the furnace. And so the men were bound, wearing their tunics and their trousers and all their garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of the blazing fire because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was overheating and the raging flames killed the men even killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. Look, the flames were so hot that people who got close to the thing burned up. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. And he said to his counselors, didn't we throw three men into the fire? And they answered the king, yes, O king. And he said, but I see four men walking unbound in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. And Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire and the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the king's counselors and they all gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. Not a hair on their head had been singed. Their tunics were not harmed. Not even the smell of the fire came from them. And Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent an angel and delivered the servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command. They yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god but their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people or nation or language that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins for there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
in the province of Babylon. We have a tradition of saying, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if this is one of those texts where this is the word of the Lord feels just a little bit, mm, not sure. We give thanks. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we enter into this complicated text, this story that some of us learned in Sunday school and realize that it is not for the faint of heart. So uh, even now as we open our hearts to the movement of your spirit, open our minds, open our lives to the ways that you will call us out of the expected paths to follow more closely your son Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Idolatry or death? Those were the choices that were before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were challenged to turn away from the justice of God, away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to turn toward, well, to turn toward a king that likes to have satraps and prefects and governors and so on, and trumpets and harps and lyres and drums. A king who would put to death any and all who failed to turn to him. Now, fortunately for all concerned, this story has a happy ending. The three young men are saved from the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar, lo and behold, has a sort of conversion experience, at least for the moment, in chapter 3. Unfortunately, since the Emperor Constantine painted crosses on the shields of his foot soldiers and Augustine wrote something called the City of God, so that's about 1,600 years, Christians have been reading this text around Nebuchadnezzar's conversion story. Understanding themselves, ourselves, in the role of missionaries who need to do everything and anything to convert people to the way of God. Now, one could argue this is important. We need people to know Jesus. We need people to know about the love of God in Jesus Christ. But this interpretation has been the rallying cry for war for centuries. It has called people to participate um, in tearing down communities where indigenous rituals and faith practices, which people would call pagan were being practiced. It made it easy to rally the troops for decades-long crusades that were supposed to be about protecting Jerusalem and the birthplace of Jesus, but ultimately secured land and titles throughout the Mediterranean and North Africa for those who simply would go to kill Muslims. This orientation towards bringing salvation to so-called heathens provide conquistadors cover as they pillage the land and the people that they discovered. It was the excuse given by slave owners who forced slave, one slave to read passages about slaves obeying their masters while the overseer flogged another slave. It's what motivated good Christian people, good Presbyterian Christian people, to take Native American children away from their parents, dress them in non-traditional clothing, cut their hair, and force them to speak English in school. As hard as it is to think about this long history of the Christian use of saving somebody by converting them, as if Nebuchadnezzar was actually saved by his declaration. If we are to stand where God stands, we are called to orient our lives around the justice of God. Not just the worship and praise of God. Worship and praise is a means to an end. It is an opportunity for us to give thanks so that we can go then and enact what God has given us to do. We have to begin by acknowledging 
that we have come from a long line of people who thought the church had all the right answers and that the leaders of the church merit blind, unwavering obedience. And this is what laid the foundation for three mission churches to be developed in South Africa. One for white people, one for mixed race people, one for black people. These three churches and their way of moving in South Africa and primarily the white church eventually created the justification for apartheid. Apartheid came out of the church. More recently, as Pastor Kurt prayed in the prayer of confession, these same systems and structures that were created to facilitate the salvation of humanity have been used to hide the actions and sustain support for pastors and priests. This is heavy, I know. And I don't know you and you don't know me, so it probably feels even heavier. For the white people in the room, we need to acknowledge this is the legacy we have inherited. And for the people in col of color in the room, we need to know that this is the complex and painful heritage from which our mutual faith has grown. It's heavy. So I invite us to just take a moment right now and just breathe. We're going to engage this text and we're going to see that there is good news. We know there's good news. It's why we're here. So let's just pause for a moment and maybe continue our confession or maybe offer up to God the realizations we're having in this moment. It's a lot, this legacy. It's a lot. But what if I told you that we have a path to move beyond the legacy, the inheritance that we've received? What if I told you that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego point us in the right direction? Point us toward the path of repentance, towards a path of reparations, towards a path of righteous resistance. I know you had Pastor Ben here a couple of weeks ago or last week. Ben and I work closely together in Oakland and he talks quite a lot about righteous resistance. It's not just resisting for the sake of resisting. This is not Star Trek and trying to resist the Borg and then learning that resistance is futile. It's a path where people of God understand that we've got to resist and that we're gonna screw up and that we have to keep at it. What if I told you that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their story wasn't an attempt to save Nebuchadnezzar's life, but was their way of demonstrating their ultimate obedience to God, and they did it by means of civil disobedience that was meant to turn Nebuchadnezzar's world upside down and save the people that he ruled? Not the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the so on and so on, but the people who found themselves under the boots of those people. Old Testament scholar Carol Newsom points out that early interpreters of this text were divided about Nebuchadnezzar's command for the statute. Did it represent a demand for political submission? Did it demand idolatrous worship? I put it to you that it did both. In God's view, submission to, support of, participation in a reality, political or otherwise, that includes oppression, imprisonment, impoverishment, that ignored and erased the marginalized was problematic. Whether it was about worshiping a king or whether it was about simply the ability of that king to get people to do what he wanted him to do. 
It didn't matter if Nebuchadnezzar was trying to get his people to bow down or to worship a Babylonian god. That's immaterial. Anything that stopped, that moved God's people away from the call to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God, God understood to be idolatrous. Nebuchadnezzar told them to eat food. It wasn't about the food. It was about the reality that God's people were supposed to live in a set-apart way. Not as some holier-than-thou thing, but a set-apart way that showed that they stood with widows and orphans, that they cared for the sick, that they fought for those who were in prison. This story was never meant to convince God's people about the importance of making converts or even about the importance of never bowing down to a graven image. It was meant to serve as a beacon of hope, a shining light that would put light on a path so that people could follow it even when they were so far away from home, in a land of exile where they were strangers, in a place and time that was ridiculous to them. And I don't mean ridiculous, ha-ha. I mean, that was ridiculous. It was ridiculously difficult, their life. It was ridiculously full of grief, their world. For a people who were ridiculously far from home and who knew themselves to be ridiculously, at times, far from what God intended them to do, and who actually understood that they should be resisting. This story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the earlier one about eating the inappropriate food and the later one that we heard about Daniel in the lion's den, these were meant to help God's people understand that the only choice they had to be righteous was to stay connected to God's call to justice no matter what no matter what. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said it best in the scripture. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't even certain that God was going to save them. Whether God saves us or not, we will do this thing. Though they seemed unsure of their deliverance, though they wondered, they committed themselves to the path. And this sends a clear message to us, and as far as I'm concerned, it couldn't come at a better time. I don't know about you, but I've had so many conversations with so many different kinds of people, and almost all of us are feeling the same thing. We are in a time when folks who never thought they would participate in anything remotely like resistance are feeling the sense of urgency, a sense of calling, a feeling, maybe, that all is not well. All is not well. All is not well when more than 500 children remain separated from their parents at the border. All is not well when the number of unhoused people in the Bay Area continues to rise. All is not well when some of our kids will go to school and be with other kids who can't even afford pencils. All is not well when black and brown people are disproportionately suspended from school, pulled over for traffic violations, wounded or killed by police officers. All is not well when parents have to worry about whether a shooter is going to show up at their kid's school. All is not well. And we know it. And when we stop to think about these things, and there are so many more, all is not well when our seniors have to die alone in a nursing home. All is not well when people have to choose between buying medicine and paying rent. All is not well. It's easy to get overwhelmed, to wonder what a person of faith can do. What can a person of faith do? 
And if you're like me, you might even be wondering, as I go home to a significantly conservative family, what will I say? What will I say to my colleagues, my neighbors, my church friends, my family members, my classmates? What do I say about the work of resistance? To be sure, there are some days I feel that resistance work is futile, that is too hard, but I'll be honest, telling my folks about the work is even harder. And some days the combination of those two things makes me feel like just staying in bed. Or worse, just going along to get along. It's in those times I'm grateful for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I'm also tremendously grateful for the confessional heritage of the Presbyterian Church, for the instruction I received in eighth grade from memorizing the Heidelberg Catechism, which in question 95 asks me to examine my understanding of idolatry as the tendency to have or invent something which invites me to put my trust in something else besides God. I'm grateful for our beautiful brief statement of faith which was written in 1984 that reminds me that I'm not alone when I do this work, that this beautiful community of faith and other communities of faith, communities of believers, are stand together. This statement proclaims, in a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in the church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. Now, this is going to surprise you, but I'm even grateful for our book of order, which is so much more than a law book than a list of do's and don'ts for pastors and elders. At the beginning of the Book of Order, our foundations of the faith call us to recognize the human tendency. We tend towards idolatry. We move in that direction, whether we want to or not, and calls us to work for the transformation of the world by seeking justice. In fact, our Book of Order calls us to be like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, hear these words. The church is to be a community of faith and trusting itself to God alone, even at the risk of losing its life. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served as a foundation for people through the ages who have made a commitment to resist. In particular, this was an important resource for Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote a letter from a Birmingham jail to remind people why he did what he did. He was writing to white churches and white pastors primarily Of course, there's nothing new, he said, about this kind of civil disobedience. It was seen sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar because a higher moral law was involved. We can never forget everything Hitler did in Germany was legal. We can never forget that Hungarian freedom fighters, what they did in Hungary, was illegal. It will be hard work. It will require much of us to show up and resist, to show out and witness as resistors. Some of us will be doing this for the first time, writing letters, speaking to neighbors, maybe stepping into the streets, going to city councils and showing up in places where somebody needs help. And it's risky work. It's work that may cause us to suffer on behalf of those around us who are in need. But isn't that what it means to follow Jesus? In Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, I encourage you to take a look sometime. Jesus stands in the synagogue and he unrolls a scroll. And he says, this is the year of the Lord's favor. I have come to proclaim freedom for the oppressed sight for the blind, and so on. 
It's a long list. And at the end of it, he rolls up the scroll and he says, you know, you probably think I've come here to work with you. And you'll say to me, physician, heal your community. But I tell you that my work is outside these doors of the synagogue. And their response to him, these are people in his hometown, people who knew him, their response to him was to try to run him off a cliff. Luke chapter 4. If we stand by people in any form of suffering and need, if we witness and, and take a stand against injustice and the world comes at us, we're in good company. It was risky for Jesus. It was risky for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it was, it'll be risky for us too. But be sure, resistance is not futile. It will bear fruit. It's not something we do alone. It's something we do together. And God is already out there, side by side with people already doing the work. Our call is just to go. May it be so for us. Amen. I'm told that you pray after the sermons. And I know that in part it's a logistical thing, right? We need to get the choir in place. We need to transition to the next thing. But I think the church also has a tradition of altar calls. And so praying after the sermon is a kind of opportunity for that too. Now, I'm not going to stand here and invite you to come, although if you wish, please feel free. But I do think we need to go to God when we've heard the word. It may be a word we don't agree with. We need to take that to God too. It may be a word that is challenging us. We need to take that to God. So I invite you now to pray with me as we do, as we go to God. God, you call us in many different ways. The ways that we live out our lives are as diverse as we are in this room. But one thing is clear. Your expectation is that we must stand where you stand. That we must do what you expect of us. We must live justly. We must love mercy as we walk humbly with you. So we ask today, God, that you would continue to work on our hearts, give us courage to face the places that you're calling us to be, give us courage to speak the words that you're calling us to speak, give us courage to ask hard questions of ourselves and of our communities. Above all, God, let us know through the strength and power of your spirit that you have not abandoned us, that you will never abandon us, that even now you are with us and that you are walking every step of this path with us. And we give you thanks in advance for all that you will do as we take up the mantle of resistance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and of your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.